Hi, everybody. Welcome to this Good Friday edition. Friday the 13th. It's not Good Friday. It is a Good Friday. It's summer here in San Francisco, one of two days or three in the year, Julie, that we get summer Mm -hmm. in San Francisco. It must be 80 degrees, isn't it? Yes, it's supposed to be 80, which is a a new record for the day, too. Oh, is it? Well, there's no breeze outside for again today for the Big Boat Series, which is going on, the Rolex Big Boat Series. They did get in one race yesterday afternoon. And uh, hopefully the breeze will come sooner or later today and then breeze on over the weekend. But in the meantime, welcome to show number 219. This is our show for the 13th. Is it the 13th? Why does my slide say the 10th? What a crouton. Shame on you. Uh, my slide says the 10th. Well, as the man said behind the curtain, <laughs> pay no attention to my croutonic slide today. We're delighted to have Ben Remmacher with us. He is standing by at the other end of our Skype, and there he is in Vancouver. We'll be back to him in a minute. Ben, thank you for joining us. And he is the class manager for three, not one, not two, but three Olympic classes, the 49er, 49er FX, and the NACRA 17. We've been trying to get Ben on the show now for quite some time, so we're delighted to have him on today to be talking everything Olympics and world sailing 2020, 2024, and I'm sure he will have some very interesting insight for us. I want to thank Commodore Phil Lotz, immediate past Commodore of New York Yacht Club, who was on with us on Tuesday. Very interesting insight, particularly into the Invitational Cup and the new IC37 by Malgus. Phil didn't have a he didn't have a lot to say about the America's Cup, but we got some breaking news for you there because American Magic, the New York Yacht Club's team, is out sailing around under sail as we speak and we're going to show you the first ever video of an ac-75 this is a spy video this was not released by the team but this was taken earlier today i actually this is a screen grab i've been watching the new york yacht club's invitational cup live television coverage and at a certain moment, this, well, it was this morning, a couple hours ago, I guess, our time, I took this screen grab as their cameras showed American Magic being towed by the racing area. The racing is north of the bridge today, and they got a shot of American Magic being towed out to go sailing. Then the team, just before we went to air, posted these three amazing photos. And you've seen, we, we broke the news on this a couple weeks ago, and we showed you their bow shots from a spy photo someone sent us. And the bow, people said, oh, it, it, this can't look like this. It looks too much like a, it's been disguised with some kind of a blow-up doll or a blow-up something. And that's what it looks like. There's a full bow-on shot. And these shots provided by the team just before we went to air with this amazing kind of, I don't know what, what it looks like to you, Julia. We keep saying it looks like a salamander nose or a snake nose, but it's a very flat, scowl-like bow, completely different treatment from what we saw down under when the Kiwis launched their boat in Auckland a week ago with a more typical destroyer, very fine destroyer-like bow. And I'm going to uh, switch over here now And with any luck, I'm going to show you this video that just was sent to me by one of our foesy. Thank you very much. I won't name him. It's not, I don't think it's a secret or anything, but this is the American magic foiling, sailing and foiling in Narragansett Bay just a few minutes ago. And the first foiling video of an AC 75. Enjoy. Oops. See if I can get that to run here. There we go. It's even a little bit of audio. Wow. Okay, I'm going to do that again. Lower in the frame. Okay. Well, that's it. We haven't we haven't seen it jibe. We haven't seen it tack, but there are people out there watching. There are a lot of people are watching because there's, it's a Friday, of course, and the Invitational Cup is going on. And this, as far as I'm aware, is the first video footage of an AC-75 full-scale foiling. 
Okay, so we're over here watching the New York Yacht Club's uh, coverage, and we'll see if they get anything up on there. If they do, uh, oops, they may be signing off for the day, too. We'll see. But this is the actual coverage, the Facebook coverage. They're streaming. I guess they're done. So they may not be sailing another race today. Let's look at this video one more time. Okay, well, it's a proof of concept. And there's the bow, as we told you a minute ago. And I'll show you those three shots one more time. It's, it's, you know, this ain't your mother's or your father's America's Cup, Julia. No. Let alone your grandparents. Amazing looking creatures, both this boat and the quite different, although aerodynamically treated, the way the, the hull looks more like it as uh, Britt Ward, when we had him on, he said it looks more like an airplane fuselage than a traditional yacht, which I think that is an understatement. Okay, well, welcome to the show. I'm Tom Eamon, your host. Julia Vedekind is our coordinating producer, and at this time we always like to put in a pitch, don't we, Julia? Yes, please. Please like, share, and subscribe. Yeah, it helps us a lot if you will kindly push the share button especially and share this show to your own Facebook page. It helps us in terms of distro and helps us in, in terms of the number of views and hence our uh, fundraising for this viewer-supported show and we also like to say to join us on sailing illustrated all almost all of you who are viewers have already clicked on the button to get the emails every time i post to the main website but also on the main website sailing illustrated.com you can join as a patron via patreon and give us a buck or 10 or 100 or whatever you are so inclined a month to help keep the lights on here in the studio and us fed, and I, as you can tell, I, I need to go get a haircut. So it would be good if somebody gave us a $20 pledge. I'd go down to Chestnut Street today, Julie, and get a bloody haircut. Not a bad idea. I look like a crouton, for sure. Okay, so much for the American Cup boat race news and the plugs, and thanks again for all of your support as we move forward. In the coming weeks, we've got not only Ben today, Ben Remacher with us, but we've got a great lineup of speakers, another Canadian, from over in Toronto, Sarah Douglas, who is the, I think it's fair to say, is Canada's leading light. We'll ask Ben about her, but the leading Olympic light at this point, she sails the laser radial. And she is, I think, she may be North America's, not just Canada's, North America's, including the U.S. and Mexico's best top Olympic hopeful at this point. So we'll talk with Sarah on the 24th, a week, not a week from today, two weeks from today, right? Yeah. No, two weeks from that past Tuesday, so a week from this coming Tuesday. Then on October 1st, Richard Gladwell will be with us. Looking forward to him coming live from Auckland, telling us everything he knows about the American Cup boat race in New Zealand and what's going on down there. And then in the future, and he's on now, Hamish Ross is watching. He will be joining us when we can work a date out. John Marshall, the esteemed America's Cup Hall of Famer who has been – in the involved in the cup in one capacity or another since the 70s and a design guru and a sailing guru former president of north sales yada yada john is joining us as are stan and sally honey and we're going to talk olympics and america's cup and television with them when we get them on in the next few weeks okay America's Cup. Let's turn our attention there because we showed you this picture of the Kiwi boat as it was splashed last week. And that's the bow on shot. And you can see how different that bow looks. I didn't have time to put them side by side, but how different their bow looks compared to New York Yacht Club's American Magic. You can see that somebody, somebody called it that thing down the middle under the hull there. Somebody said, oh, that looks like a pregnant dolphin and of course the name of this boat is in maori is the dolphin and that's what to many of us this little thing down the middle of the hull looks like ben did you know we had a telestrator have you seen the show before uh, so then this is the boat being towed around we've shown you that picture i showed that to you on tuesday and we showed you this video of the boat being towed and it, 
looks like this is a spy video from, I think, in front of the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron, taken by a friend. And the boat, you can see foiling there on the left, being towed by that boat well out front. And it's foiling. It's up in the air. And in what looks like stable flight. Speed limit's 12 knots. In the harbor where they are now. And they're clearly going more than the speed limit in the harbor, but they're still proceeding on what looks nice, stable flight. There are some other videos of them being towed where it was not so stable, and indeed, somebody said it looks like they were porpoising. And there's some speculation that they're back because they haven't been seen again. They've been back in the shed. They say, the team says it's because of the poor weather in Auckland. It's the end of their winter, the early early weeks of their spring about to be officially and it can be as most of you will know it can be windy and gusty and rainy and so on down there in the best of times but particularly this time of year so and cold so we'll see but if they're back in the shed because of making mods well that wouldn't be a surprise either you know you go out and you tow the thing around they have not remember they have not had a test boat like new york and ben ainsley and the prada so those three teams have been f- testing in their smaller version foiling surrogate. Well, they're not technically surrogate boats, but they're test boats. So New York, on the other hand, came right out of the box when they splashed a couple days later. And they were sails up. And I ran the story that uh, this breaking news that both New York Yacht Club and uh, well, I don't have, that's not this story, but I wrote up, I ran a previous story that both teams were out on the water. The Kiwis and American Magic sails up and then New York indeed foiled. They sailed and this was Tuesday after our show. And this was the picture they sent to me and then to the rest of the media eventually. And it's a, it, it was the initial shot of a foiling AC-75. I'm told it's not photoshopped. But there's still quite some interesting things here that Britt Ward would probably point out, like how many crew heads are above the shear line of the boat. But this is practice sailing. This is testing. This is probably not race trim yet. Then the team yesterday afternoon, late yesterday afternoon, sent me this photo. And then they went out with a press release, their new sponsor, their TSI on the side of their boat. And it's a cool shot. There's all the boats will have that treatment at the top of the mainsail with their country flag below it. The Prada Cup presented by Prada. They're not only running the Challenger Selection Series as the Prada Cup, but then they are the presenting sponsor of the 36th America's Cup. Prada is TSI is instrumentation company, of course, along with Airbus. And that's the boat in full flight and in full frame. And now you've seen the video of her actually foiling that we showed you, I think, in a, in a world first. I don't know if anybody else has that video or if any other media at least has had that video, but there it is. One other thing that went out with the press release, they took a shot up the rig, and this obviously to, for the branding for TSI, the instruments company, but you can see the spreaders and the mast. They, the, the spreaders are obviously uh, not fixed because the mast is a pivoting mast. It's a rotating mast so that it is the angle of attack to give it like, a, like most catamaran masts are, for example, in other high-performance boats. And just an interesting rig shot there for you all. In other America's Cup news, the Kiwis have put an ad out here in the last couple of days for more boat builders, saying boat builders wanted. And that's interesting because normally they would have already had their crew that built B1, the boat that's there you see in the image and that we've all seen. And that same team then would move into boat building mode for B2 which has to happen here pretty quickly because most of the teams will be committing the lines for B2 this month or so I'm told. But if they're hiring more boat builders, what does that mean? Do you suppose that means they're doing more mods to B1? So they need that many more boat builders. Maybe so. Maybe so. What do you think, Julia? Either that or, or the, 
the market shifted. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a, that's a point. It's a good point. It could have happened. But we'll we'll see. We'll be checking that story. Meanwhile, there's been very little news from the other two teams. This is a shot of guess who? James Spithill. That's Jimmy. And yeah. I, you got to love the style and the panache of Luna Rosa. They've got the best looking. They've always had the best looking gear. Absolutely. Best yeah. looking team bases, the best looking everything, boats. And no doubt, again, I mean, this is just magical. And I think they don't have a lot else to report because I hear now from a source that their splash date for their B1, which was to be in August, then got pushed into early September. Now, we were last told late September. I hear it slipped now to early October. I can't confirm that. The team says, no, no, we'll, we'll let you know and we know. But we'll see. Meanwhile, Sir Ben Ainsley's team, I don't even have a slide for them, but Sir Ben Ainsley's team has been doing dredging work so that alongside their pier so they can put their boat in the water. And why they didn't do that months ago, if they knew that was needed, maybe they didn't figure out that it was necessary until, or maybe the tide, there's a lot of tide in that area uh, in Portsmouth. So maybe the currents pushed the under, you know, the seabed or the floor around a little bit. And if so, well... They had to do some more dredging. A lot of folks out here, welcome to all of you. I'm not going to name you all, but uh, I see Brazil and Australia and Montreal, Montreal and Malta. Marcus Spillane, your boss is on here, Ben, so he's checking to be sure you do a good job, right? I'll put your, let me turn your mic up, Ben. Welcome. Hi, thanks. Welcome. Good to have you on here. Ben Remacher in Vancouver is the class manager for the 49er, 49er FX, and NACRA. His boss, Marcus Splain, is is Marcus the president of all three of those classes, the volunteer president? Yeah. Cool. Okay, so he's watching. Yeah, there's just two classes. Sorry? But 49er and 49er FX are one class, so um, two classes. Well, just it, it, it's one class, but it's really two classes for the purposes of Olympic disciplines. I hear I'm yeah. giving you credit for managing three classes. Take it, man. That's right. Take it. <laughs> Marcus Spillane's on a lot of thumbs up and hearts. Sean Har, Owen Miller, Rob Fry. I don't know if Rob's down in Auckland. Normally he is. Jody Shields is on his way to Marseille for the final sale GP event, which is not this weekend, but the following weekend. We'll run some promos on that next Tuesday. And Rob Fry's actually in front, so he may be headed also, one suspects, to Marseille. And uh, lots of other folks on here – uh, again, David Price, Pricey uh, normally in Sydney, Pedro Foiling Sailor, Pedro, whose real name is Stevenson, and his real name is William Stevenson, William Peter Stevenson, where he's watching from a big night at Port Zeelanda in the Netherlands where the Laser World's Masters free food and all you can <laughs> drink. And, and he's I, happy. <laughs> and I checked the standings, Julia, and uh, our, you know, we, we quite like Pedro. He's got a great sense of humor, don't we? And yes. A lot of fun to have him on the show. And I, he's not doing real well in his division at the Laser Masters, which I believe it all wraps tomorrow. But we got another Fozy we'll tell you about at the end of the show who's leading uh, solidly on top in his division. Warren Schauscher's on in Germany. or he's No, he's in Brisbane. Good to see an overwhelming vote for the Laser. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a sec. And on and on, Davis Island Yacht Club with Bill Wingrove and Andrew McPherson. Bill Canfield, hello, Mr. President, President of the U.S. Virgin Islands Sailing Association. Paul Henderson is watching, one of your friends up, Ben, in, in O Canada. You know Paul, I'm sure, quite well. And it'll be nice to see if he has any questions or comments for you as well. He sent me some, actually, now that I think about it. Uh, Trevor Walker, Paul Homchick. Pavel Vilkowski, Hi, Pavel is a new name, and on and on and on. Rick Hayes in Chicago. Again, I can't name everybody. Ziv Levanan is on. Chris Elliott, Justin Palm, John Emmett is watching. John, congrats. We're going to talk about you in a minute. So, David Hick, fun a new fact, name. Uh, fun fact, Tom. John Emmett was the first person I sailed 49er with when I moved from Canada to the UK. Really? So you know John as well. Cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. a lot of people on he here to hear what good. you've got to say, and I'm glad John's on here. He's doing. He's winning his division. I'll, I'll blow my slide in a minute, but he's had almost all bullets in the in his uh, young division. It's called the Apprentice Division at the Laser. <laughs> the Apprentice with 35 to 45 year olds. David Hick, bit concerned about the stability of these boats when they are stationary, big mass, but no keel. Any comments? Uh, it's an open. It's not a secret. The um, 
the teams all say that the real problem is spiking the toe, is when they've been towing, and then they have to get off the toe and start sailing to have stability um, from that point, during that transition from toe to sailing is the most, that's the scariest time. David Robinson, uh, the esteemed general manager across the Bay of San Francisco Yacht Club's watching. And uh, Andrew Morris is on the Gold Coast in Australia, garden spot in the world. Let's get on with uh, Ben. Ben, welcome to the show. Uh, tell us, if you would, please, just a little bit about yourself and your background and how did you come to be the class manager for the 49ers and the NACRA 17? Yeah, sure. So uh, well, I grew up here in Vancouver, um, played a lot of sports and got into sailing. Well, so did some like lessons as a kid and then uh, started racing at 13 um, and got a little more serious about it when I was maybe 16. That was right when um, the 49ers was being introduced to the Olympics and I with my partner here, we actually thought about trying to go for the Sydney Olympics, but uh, did a deal with my old man that I should probably go to university, and it was a good decision. Uh, went out east to Kingston and uh, did engineering and economics. At Queen's, Queen's university. university. Yeah. We used to stay and, in the uh, dorms there during Cork. That's We'd right. stay in the dorms when we were up there racing fireballs in, I guess, 470s. Yeah, that was how I was introduced to Kingston as well, was out doing cork. So it was a friendly place and a good place to sail. Um, got into like uh, sailing team leadership and stuff like that. But uh, but after university, moved over to England. Uh, the support system for Canada wasn't uh, very strong, and I knew I wanted to sail 49ers. So I went out and moved to the south coast of England. And uh, as I mentioned, I sailed with John Emmett a little bit and another guy, Paul Towers, who was a 505 world champion. And uh, just worked an engineering job and sailed on the weekends and, and in the evenings and uh, kept progressing 49er sailing and uh, started sailing when we could arrange it with Gordon Cook, who uh, is mm. a Canadian who, uh, who ended up you know teaming up with properly full time. And then we raced a couple of years full time and, and qualified for Beijing. And uh, after Beijing, I uh, went back to work. <laughs> pay for real life so uh did four more years in uh in engineering actually consulting to the oil field uh up in alaska mostly but other places around the world as well and then in 2012 i was still involved uh in volunteer side of 49er a little bit with marcus and malav um, marcus bauer as well and others simon hiscox and um we were trying to get the women's skiff into the olympics and seiko had come on board as a sponsor so uh, we decided to take the 49er class to have a professional leadership instead of all volunteer leadership. And I was the first person in the role and I'm still here now. Um, and then I guess a bunch of the NACRA 7 or a bunch of the NACRA 17 sailors were ex 49er sailors in 2016. Mm. So um, in April of 2016, they we happened, they were training in Barcelona when we had our Europeans there and we got to talking and and they got Marcus in as the president and me in as the managers to take over an Acre 17 as well. So um, so you've been at this for six years, is it? Five years? Since September 2000, seven years, yeah. September 2012, yeah. Okay, what's the toughest part of the job? Uh, the is it, man is I, it managing up? Is it managing Marcus, <laughs> your president who's watching? Or is it managing down or something else? No, Marcus and I get along get along great actually. So uh, so that's easy. We talk pretty much daily. Um, he's he's busy with his job in New York, but uh, but we find a, some time to talk, you know, all the time or message at least. Um, I, the part I like the least is actually the world sailing stuff, the ISAF stuff. Uh, it's the worst week of my year every year going to that conference. Um, you know, whether whether it's us under the gun or or some of our friends, we're pretty pretty tight. The Olympic class managers and and presidents and. Uh, you know, it's always someone trying to put pressure on from somewhere or other. So that's a pretty, I, I don't enjoy that part of the job at all. Um, but it balances out with the best part of the job, which is uh, seeing all the sailors and all their energy and passion and, and trying to serve them. Well, it's it's not part of your job per se to rep at World Sailing, but you are a rep on a couple of committees, a couple of key roles. Tell us about what you have volunteered to do within World Sailing and tell us about what you know potential conflicts of interest that, that inevitably do come along. Yeah, so there's a Olympic classes subcommittee, which um, every manager and president is on. Uh, we we are one of the first meetings of the week every time, and we typically limit our agenda to things that we can agree on. 
Um, not necessarily agree on the outcome, but uh, things that don't separate us uh, as classes. So that so all of us are, are part of world sailing structured that way. And then starting this quad, uh, well, there's always an, a classes rep on the events committee, and typically our chairperson, Corinne, served as the chairwoman of the Olympic classes subcommittee, served on council, and did events committee. But she decided it was too much for this quad and wanted to, you know, divide up the roles. It's a non-paid <laughs> role, so uh, so I was voted as the um, Olymp sorry, the events committee rep for 2016 through to 2020, and that's so I've been doing that. And within that, I've been uh, the, on the a bunch of the working parties, and currently I'm, a, I'm the chair of the event strategy working party. And what's the event strategy? Is that big picture long term about the Olympics? Um, more to do with uh, the regattas in between Olympics uh, for the first time with the Olympics naming Paris and L.A. back to back. We got an eight year window where we could figure out where we were going to be in the world, because uh, obviously the Olympic venue determines a lot about Olympic sailing. And um, so, so meaning so the world, the world, the World Cup circuit and joint world championships, that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Like there's been a lot of conflict with the World Cup recently um, and also with some of our major championships like the Europeans and the Worlds and also what you might call the classic events like the Palmas here, Metamblix and Kiel's. Um, so it was an opportunity for us to plan long term for how best to organize the whole calendar and and other aspects of the of the event strategy, commercial um, rankings, things like that. So we're pretty close to coming out with a new paper that the principals were involved, were uh, agreed last November. So just you know taking it a little farther and I'm working on some of those details. Yeah, and, and we saw your paper <laughs> the discussion in um, November, I guess. And will you have a new paper in Bermuda coming out? Yeah, we're well, an updated version. It's very similar, but uh, but we have taken some of the concepts uh, a little farther and in, in a little different way. But uh, we're just about to circulate that for um, comment from all the classes and the working parties and uh, the office. You know, obviously Andy and Kim and those guys are going to want to say and and M and A's and regatta. So we're we're about to take it for internal consultation and ideas to advance before we put it forward. I suppose, to the events committee and then onwards up the structure. Well, I, I hope you'll submit it publicly sooner than later so that you get more, you know, you you solicit. You watch this show. You hear all the bitching and moaning that I and others do about world sailing, particularly the non-sailing CEO. And we know, everybody knows that this, we've had any number of people on here who have told us and said that the World Cup, circuit which has been going on not not to blame the current administration or your committee or anybody else been going on since the 90s and it never has worked it's it's hugely expensive it costs world sailing a lot of money it gets no the idea was to build up an annual circuit and we'd get television coverage for olympic sailors you know the idea the goals i suppose were right but the execution probably the strategy were flawed if not you know ass backwards from the start so I hope now that I have your attention, and we got a lot of people on here whose comments and and uh, questions will be are, are already forthcoming. And Julia's Julia's over there monitoring her phone and computer. She's got everybody's. Uh, we'll get to her in a sec. But well, I hope you. I, I hope you in. will. You know, we'll jump if I can in. Jump in. I mean, hey, let me let me just finish the, let me finish the oh, point sure, and then and then come to. You. I hope you guys will S can. The shy, that's the German word Scheiße. <laughs> we, I hope you'll ask can the world this World Cup. It just makes no sense. It's really hard, as you know, better than most for North American sailors to be competitive. It's very hard for the sailors down under. It's very hard for the sailors in the southern hemisphere uh, of the West, you know, of Brazil and Argentina and, and Chile and so on. I hope you get rid of it. Because it, let these regattas, let the clubs, let them stand on their own, let the sailors choose to go where they're going. If it's Weymouth, if it's Yer, if it's Palma, if it's Miami, go do it. Go to it and have these regattas, which have always flourished. They have a regatta in Melbourne if they do that, if they have one down in, in Rio or in, tell me where, in, in Buenos Aires. Get rid of it and then have your joint world championship instead of mid-cycle. What, what we used to do, and I thought, always thought it made a lot of sense, do the joint world championships in effect as the Olympic pre-regatta 
the year before the Olympics. Is this a possibility coming out of your committee? Yeah, I think this could be music to yours. We've already agreed in principle to stop the standalone World Cups that were quota limited and, and run by World Sailings. That was a principle agreed in November. So congratulations. Uh, you got it. Um, let me give you some highlights of, I think, what's already been agreed and, and announced, but possibly not communicated very well. Uh, we're going to have the first half of the year, which is January through June, set aside for um, class or regattas, perpetual regattas, you know, the, the big multi-class annual regattas that, uh, you know, people got really used to, the Miamis, Melbournes, Palma, Keel, and, and all those. Uh, and then the second half of the year is going to be for championships. Uh, there is going to be a standalone, sorry, a, a, a World Cup final, which is a, a single event, but it's going to be combined with the test event. So it's going to be in the Olympic venue and it's going to be a popular regatta. Um, so we're basically just rebranding the test events to be a World Cup final so they can be exploited commercially a little bit better. Is that, an annual, we'll have, is, is that joint event? Is that an annual event or... It will be annual. The year one, we're still kind of figuring out what to do with year one. Um, I think probably in 2021, it'll be popular to go to Marseille. We got to do a little bit of discussion to see if it's going to be popular to go to Long Beach in 2025. Uh, of course, it will be in 26 and 27 and 28, but uh, we got to decide a few details. But um, yeah, annual. When we ran the Olympics in 84, and I was then executive director of U.S. Sailing, so it's, you know, it's a different world today. But we ran, we put together an, an organization, the Southern Californians did, a terrific group called OCROC, Olympic Classes Regatta Organizing Committee. And they ran a practice event in 81, 2, and 3. And the 83 event was not restricted, as a lot of these pre-Olympic regattas are, they're not restricted to one or two boats per country. It was basically open. It was open slather. And people could come from all over the world and participate at the Olympic venue and get a taste. And it, it really helped tune up the everybody, tuned up the competitors, tuned up the organizers. And I hope you will be doing something like that again, officially from World Sailing. I don't know how this beginning of the year, end of the year thing is going to work for trying to force, I guess, world championships into the second half of the year. Is that what the idea is there? Yeah, so the... The Europe and there's listen. This paper is pretty long and pretty detailed. Um, so, but I'll give you the broad strokes. The the Europeans should be in July every year. So basically, right after Kiel, you can go off and do your Europeans, and then you go back to the Olympic venue for this World Cup final slash test event, uh, and then you've got September through December to hold Worlds. Um, that should fit them in almost any venue, and um, and at the same time, we're also dividing up the seasons. Um, so that you can't score any more points um, in Europe after after those major championships. And, and you've got to go home if you want to score any more points to try and encourage people to go back to their home continents um, to, to get a little more sustainability, a little more cost containment. Um, of course, sailors can still do whatever they want, but it gives an opportunity for all the continental associations to tie their elite sailors with their, their up and coming domestic sailors and to build a regional regatta network that, um, that you know, people can rely on and, and build up. So um, we're hoping to shift away from the perpetual round the world, constant motion World mm. Cup circuit that's been basically too expensive to carry out um, and give people, give the, give the regions a, a bigger role. Okay. So uh, we can come back to that. And Julie, I don't know if you've got any pressing questions. A lot of people on here, in fact, as usual, but um, I see Craig Monks on, John Emmett, of course, Lloyd Gilmore, Robert Deves, who's the PR guy for the fin class, does a terrific job, and many, many other people. Let's talk about SMODs, about single manufacturer one designs, because that's been a burning issue, burning question. We know the laser has been approved again as for, for 2024, unanimously, 30 to nothing vote of the council, and that surprises absolutely nobody. Uh, disappoints a few people because they thought, well, it's a 50-year-old boat. There's something better. We find a better laser, the RS Arrow or the tell me what. But th that was not going to happen because that boat is so well distributed. There are multiple manufacturers. The problem that's been going on, as you know as well or better than I, between the various manufacturers and the class seem to be getting sorted out, knock on wood. And the laser is at least being built now in Japan and Australia and Europe and soon to be built, I'm one hears, 
in the U.S. and maybe in South America. So we'll see how that all pans out. But the idea of there being single manufacturer one designs, which is the case, if, if, tell me if I'm wrong, but what, what is the case with the 49ers, both 49 and 49er FX, the, and the, 49er, we have, and oh, the NACRA? Go ahead. Sure, yeah, the 49er, we have three boat builders, two of which are active. One mast maker, one sail maker, and I can give you a little update on there in a second. And then the NACRA 17 is single manufacturer for all the major parts. Uh, one builder for e for the hulls, one builder for the beams, sails, masts, the, and, uh, and the foils. They're all different, but uh, but there's only one of them each. And, and is that going to change? Because there's a lot of pressure from, the, as you know, from the EU and otherwise, and it has caused big problems with part supplies, and especially in the NACRA, as you again know better than I. Is that going to continue, or is that going to change? The it's gonna it's gonna largely continue as it is right now. Um, the what the EU wants is competition for the contracts, and they want justification for any restrictions. So, um, so to, for competition, that means we have to put the um, parts out for tender. And I, and I said it'd be a little update for the 49er. So in the 49er, we've just recently uh, retendered for the mast contract, and it's going to a new builder starting right after the Olympics. And um, I don't think they've announced it publicly, so I won't say who it is, but there will be a new mast builder for the existing mast uh, design starting um, right after Tokyo. And, um, you know, that was lots of, you know, plenty of the names you'd know in the mast building world applied for that contract and the one with the best bid won it. And um, and so the EU and, and other, listen, every country's got, um, got antitrust and anti-monopoly laws. So they require competition for these bids. And we have to do a better job of being transparent about when those contracts are up and how you can apply to bid for. The the contracts have been up for grabs many times in the past. We've changed sailmakers twice in 49er, for example. Um, but we didn't often uh, it was it was you know Julian basically just did it. Yeah, but but Ben, it doesn't. It, to me, what you're telling me is you put it. You you got another sole source mass supplier. It sounds like coming That's up right. after the Olympics. And the the thing that people object to, you know, in, in a lot of these Olympic classes, you used to be able to build one in your garage, and as long as it measured, and then so people then they built one for themselves. They built one or two or three for their friends, whatever the class was and even in glass, even in carbon, and then various people got involved. But, and inevitably, multiple manufacturers bring the cost down because it's competitive. When there's a single manufacturer, they can jack the price up to whatever they think the market will bear and then some because the, the, the sailors have no option. Is it going to continue as sole source parts as well as hulls for these classes? Uh <laughs> You've got a few assumptions in there, but for the most part, I think it is going to remain single source. The reason for that is technical. Um, and I'll go to the most extreme example, which would be the NACRA foils. So a set of foils is roughly 7,000 euros, which is a big ticket item in an Olympic campaign. And if there were multiple builders, they're so um, uh, precise to build, or precise isn't necessarily the right word, but... Um, they're so fine to build them the same that you'd end up having competition within the builders to, to make the better ones, but it would cost the sailors a fortune. You, you can imagine if you had to go buy 10 sets of foils in a quad just to find out which is the brand that's doing something slightly differently and, and catching up. I mean, that's 70,000 euros. Um, ultimately, the single, man single manufacturer one design process is, is meant to contain the costs in that way. Well, I understand, and of course, it's, I understand when it's you're meant at a to. single manufacturer, when you're at a single manufacturer, you can suffer from from consistency. Typically, my sailors are most concerned about consistency and durability right. because it is one design. They don't have to worry about the performance that much as long as it's consistent. And you know, when there's no one to keep the manufacturers honest, you can have breakdowns. We've seen it. I've seen it many times in in our classes where manufacturers have let off the gas at certain times, and it and it hasn't always been great. And we've been served really well by the partnership. Well, not the partnership, by the competition between Ovington and McKay. And we've had some discussions within the classes about how, how to get a second builder for certain parts put in, and, and that's ongoing. Okay. Julia? I, I just on this point, the international availability of parts is serious. 
Yeah, what about that, Ben? Because we did, thanks, Julia. We keep hearing from people, particularly the South Americans, particularly the West Coast here in the U.S., and it's not just with respect to you. It's the lasers class, too. When I had Mr. Um, I'm blanking on the name, the guy who's, who's the manager, managing director of, of performance, of, of um, yes, laser Rastigar. performance. What, what's his name? Far, far, uh, far Zed, Rastiger? Yeah, Far, yeah. far Zed Rastiger. Okay. And and as far as we had, a, you I'm sure you saw the show, a great discussion. But you know, he really didn't want to acknowledge the fact that there is a big problem with parts supply, and we keep hearing that about NACRA. And you say, well, you're keeping the costs down. Well, a lot of people that are saying that the single sources, single sourced supply, is what's keeping the prices high. And 100% uh, import taxes. Well, yeah, to say nothing of taxes and duties in various countries. Yeah. So. This is going to continue, you're saying? For the most part, it's going to continue. We are we are talking about opening up some items. For example, I'm really interested to see how this registered series production goes with the kites and theoretically one of the windsurf classes, depending on which ones get in. You know, that's, an, that's a blend of the open design uh, with the single manufacturer one design concept. I'm really curious to see how that plays out over the next few years, because that could be a really interesting thing for our masts and our sails, where you give them a box, but and um, and, and they have to build consistently with, you know, they, they put out a design for a certain amount of time and they have to sell it to anyone that shows up, uh, but then it can move on. I think I think that could be a really interesting concept, but we've never seen it proved it, proven out. And, and I'm excited to see it proven out at the 600 euro a, a kite uh, price point instead of the 7,000 euro a set of boards price point mm. before we would jump right in. But we're watching it for sure. It's, it's very interesting. Okay. Well, I think you're going to get pressure from countries and from sailors. And I, I think the sport, my personal view, as you know, I've said it any number of times before, and I appreciate you coming on and sharing your views, but the idea that you can show up with something and if it measures, it's legal to sail. And if you build it yourself or somebody else builds it and you're not forced to buy it from some particular supplier, that to me, the free market, the open market has always, not only I think, served the world well, at least the <laughs> capitalist world, but I think it has served our sport well. And I hope, I encourage you to have a hard look again. And I know you're going to get lots of pressure from, and World Sailing is getting lots of pressure. And maybe World Sailing thinks they're going to raise money by having these sole sources. They're going to have to control the source, control the supply. It starts to me to sound like... Doesn't, World Sailing doesn't make more money. They make money for every time we sell anything. So they, they just, they, they're not making more money when it's sole source. They, we, like, for uh, example... Hey, like, hang, well, hang on, hang this on. Is, there this are this people top, involved in World Sailing. No, Tom, let me finish off. This is top of conversation. We just had a big open forum in Enoshima with all my sailors discussing this very topic. And um, and I know what my sailors think on this topic. They they were quite open to us asking for a second builder on certain parts, and we're going to ask for a second builder on certain parts. But you know, the class doesn't own any of this stuff. It's all owned by the copyright holders. Um, so, you know, but the class didn't want a, an open design contest. They they didn't. The, the, none of them. One none of them wanted it. They were quite interested in the way we have it with. McKay and Ovington in the 49er, where they have each company has to build to a set standard, and uh, and then there's a little bit of competition, but manageable. You only have if you really want to check, you can buy one of each, but it's not one of ten. That that they were interested in, but they they didn't want a design contest. Well, I know that. But but hang on, you just said the key thing too that I I, I wasn't really going to get into all this, but you said the copyright holder. Who are the copyright holders for the NACRA and for the 49er? Uh, so for 49er, it's Julian Bethwaite. For, for 49er FX, it's McKay Boats, which, so it's, the boat is still Julian's boat, but then the rig and the sails uh, were developed by McKay ahead of 2012. And then for um, NACRA, it's NACRA. Okay, and are there people, uh, we hear, we keep hearing that there are people within World Sailing who are principals in those companies, uh, World Sailing officials. I've never heard that. Well, I, I don't think so. I think I know who owns these things, the pre, the people, and I don't think they have anything to do with world sailing. Okay. Well, there are a lot of people who feel otherwise. Let's talk. Let's go back to the classes themselves, and then we're going to go to all the questions and comments that are on here. And thanks again. We've got Ben Remacher. I'll put his title back up, who's with us <laughs> in Vancouver via Skype, of course. And let's go look back here at the slides now. 
And one of the cool things about the 49er is that it is attracting and has attracted a lot of the very top sailors in the world, especially who have moved on to the America's Cup. you got the current America's Cup winners in Pete Burling and Blair Took, two of ETNZ's crew, who are not only met former medalists, silver and then gold, in 2012 and 2016, respectively, but now are back at the top of the class. And that must be pretty exciting for the class. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the 49ers really attracted a ton of great sailors. Actually, the NACRA 17 has, has attracted a ton of great sailors, too. I think we're going to have something like 13 gold medalists down at our, at our combined world championship in Auckland, which um, if you divide you know but that's per people like so that's double-handed class but uh, that's a lot of gold medalists in a in a three <laughs> yeah. in a three boat regatta and um it depends whether or not sofia becaturo shows up or not whether whether it's 13 or 14 but you know that's a lot of talent that never mind the silver and bronze medalists and world champions and you know it's pretty cool the 49ers have been able to attract people like shimmy fantel and his brother mihail mihail um, to switch over and try it. And, you know, we had Robert Scheidt coming in and trying it uh, a little bit earlier, the squad. And, you know, it's a fun boat to sail. So, um, so that's going really well. Okay, so that's the 49er. And you say it's really one class. The 49er FX, which is the women's skiff in the Olympics. I don't know who this crew was. Drives me nuts when people... That's Martin put... and Kaina. Yeah, from what country? From Brazil, so that's uh, Martin Grail and Kaina Kunz, the gold medalists from Brazil, and Martin just went and did the Volvo. Uh, Martin is, I mean, if you're hiring a pro sailor, Martin's the one you need to hire. I can't believe she doesn't have a sail GP job yet, uh, but she's she's just uh, has so much energy and and her instincts on the water are unbelievable. And uh, they're coming back. They're they're ready to defend. They've been they probably had the best season this year. Well, one hears that that's only a matter of time, but she, of course, is busy with the Olympics again. What's the difference between the 49er and the 49er FX? Uh, so the boat, everything that they're standing on and below the water is the exact same, and it's a different mast, different sails, and that's it. S smaller sail plan, slightly smaller sail plan? Yeah, it's like a 17% smaller sail plan or something, so the mast is a little shorter and the sails are a little smaller, and they go... <laughs> I don't know if you know this, we redesigned the Spinnaker in 2016. It was because the FX was faster than the 49er in the upper wind range. Um, and the guys didn't like that. So uh, so we had to redesign the 49er Spinnaker for them. But it's fast. Like, uh, it's, it's plenty fast, especially when the reprise gets up. Yeah, and the, these boats are cool. They're fun to watch. Uh, one of the problems is, though, that they're so expensive and so difficult, relatively so, and they're difficult to sail. You don't see them at the club level. You don't see them at the Kingston Yacht Club. You don't see them at St. Francis Yacht Club. You see the odd 29er as a training boat, but you don't see local fleets of these boats, and I guess that's just the nature of the beast, isn't it? They are hard to sail. You've got to be fully committed uh, fitness-wise. Both people have to be coordinated. Uh, but they're getting easier to sail, like the new all-carbon mast, which I sailed on a half-aluminum, half-fiberglass uh, mast. It was much harder to sail. These ones are, you're able to control the mast pedals better so you can depower, and it's a little lighter up, 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 aloft, so it doesn't tip over as much. And with the FX as a stepping stone, you get a lot of youth sailors, male and female, going into the FX from that sort of 18 through 21-year-old age mm. group. Uh, and then if they're men, they, they've got a whole bunch more experience under their belts before they switch over to the 49er. And obviously the women uh, can stay put. So it's so, you know, our youth fleet is massive now, our junior fleet, I should say. Um, you know, we've had 100 boats at each of the last two junior world championships, which in the past we would have feared getting none. We actually dropped the age from under 24 to under 23 because there was so much strength and we're still getting bigger numbers than ever. So, the, you know, as people have sort of, Realize this high performance pathway is here to stay. Uh, the America's Cups, obviously, uh, maybe the ultimate destination. Uh, CLGP, GC32, and all the rest. Uh, 29ers, obviously, huge now. I don't know if you saw, they've got 250 boats now at their championships, and they can all pretty much sail. So it is more accessible than it's been in the past, but you know, it's still a tough boat to sail. It's yep. you could have it by yourself and spend you know four days a week on it and enjoy every one because they were all hard. Okay, let's change the slide now. We'll go to the NACRA. Tell us about the pros and cons of the NACRA. What, what, let's talk about not the safety issues yet, but how the, the class has really changed greatly. It started out as a non-foiling boat, and then it's changed as a foiling boat for this Olympiad. 
Are there more changes coming down the pike if the class, well, the class will stay for 2024? Yeah, so the original NACO 17 design, I think it was completed six months before ETNZ went foiling. So it had the sort of lifting theory where there was no elevator on the rudder and, and curved centerboards, and that was considered state of the art. And then six months later, you know, all of catamaran racing just got turned upside down by the foiling. And, um, and you know, we saw, we all saw what happened with the last two America's Cups and, and now this America's Cup. So the NACRA 17, um, I was brought in in April of 2016 when, when you know, the discussion about foiling was in full swing. Uh, at the same time, there were a lot of reliability issues with the hulls um, and, and lots of the parts of the boat, but especially the hulls. And... Um, we were going to have to do a massive upgrade to the hulls anyways for strength. Like uh, none of them were holding together. None of them could withstand the loads that the sailors were putting them under. This is still with the sea foiling configuration. This is before they were full foiling. This is before they were full foiling. Like the last quad, the, the 2013 to 2016 quad, all the boats were falling apart. I think it, and I think in early 2015 or 2016, a container load all arrived in Palma together and 15 of the 16 boats split in half on the first day of sailing. Mm -hmm. So that was what the class was dealing with. Um, so there needed to be a redesign of the hulls. And of course, you know, when you're going to redesign your hulls, you have an opportunity to redesign more stuff than that if you want to. Um, we led a class vote about whether or not we should go foiling as a class in, I want to say, July of 2016. I can't remember the exact date. And that was two thirds to one third wanted to go foiling. Um, and then later that fall, uh, World Sailing also voted to go foiling in November, and, and then NACRA, so, NACRA started building foiling boats. Um, I think the first ones were delivered in February of 17, or, or roughly. So that was the evolution to foiling. Um, what was the rest of your question? Uh, I mean, no, so that, that's and, a, I've yeah. got this video I want to go to, and you've got an announcement to make, but let's hold on to that video for a sec. Let's go back and talk about the safety issues of this class, because we know some people have gotten hurt, and it's not just in this class. It's in any of the foiling boats. Or uh, One of the theories is that ET and Z have built their AC-75 with everybody down, so low in the boat, not only for lowering, lowering the CG, but that they may not even be moving side to side when the boat tacks and jibes. And there may even, some people are speculating, and I don't know, we're trying to find out, there may be a tunnel from side to side in the boat so that people can move side to side below deck. This Gliss America's Cup class doesn't have a, a, a rule that you have to have people above deck and the, and the grinding above deck and so on the winches as, as we used to have in the 12s and the IACC boats. And part of the reason is they don't want people falling off. They don't want people jumping from side to side like we see in the AC-50s, the, the F-50s now that, that Russells and uh, Larry are using for Sail GP. And people fall off, and it's, it's scary. People get sliced up by the foils, and that's a problem in the knacker, isn't it? Yeah, the, um, so we did a risk assessment before we started foiling, and um, the the hit by your own boat was on it, but but it wasn't our highest risk scenario as we imagined. Our highest risk scenarios were, were collisions and people hitting each other. So mm. if, if you were off the boat getting hit by someone else. So we did, a, we did some things like we put in the spreader mark and we put in these exclusion zones where there couldn't be spectator boats and, and helmets and, and things like that. But it's turned out that the biggest remaining risk anyways is with... Uh, I'll just call them foil strikes, where you fall off your own boat and get hit by your rudder as uh, as you're in the water and it's going by. Um, so the risks are basically um, bedded in mass times velocity squared. Um, these boats weigh roughly 160 kilos, and then you've got 140 kilos, 35 kilos of people, uh, I suppose, divided by two if one falls off. And they're going, you know, pretty fast, especially for mm -hmm. Olympic-sized dinghies. And... Um, and the rudders are solid, you know, and for years in catamaran sailing, the rudders have been kick up. And um, because of the vertical force that uh, that these rudders produce, mm -hmm. they can't kick up. They have to be fixed in place. And um, so if, if the sailor falls off, especially the crew who's a little farther forward, mm -hmm. and especially if there's a heel, uh, uh, like if the boat is at all healed, you can tell by the time they hit the water. I don't know if you've ever fallen off a trapeze, but you don't even know you've fallen until you're hitting the water. Like it, it's so fast, the gravity acting on you. And 
pretty much equally as quickly you're swept into the back of the boat. So the I, crews I don't have, really have time to act. I have done just about everything possible on a trapeze, whether it was on an FD or a fireball or on a Hobie, you know, all sorts of boats. I, you know, the biggest problem originally before you were foiling and I mean, obviously you capsize, that's no big deal. You fall into the main, but if you bury the bows, you end up around the forest <laughs> force yeah. day but yeah. falling in the water and then getting having a foil strike is is obviously a scary moment i hear there's some kevlar clothing being tried by the class and is that true one of our guests somebody yeah. on here yeah. said that what's that all about yeah so well so the you 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 remember and you reported on anyways the when cp got injured quite badly that was november almost two years ago yeah um that was when we first, you know, realized how severe uh, the foil strikes could be, and um, and we went through sort of a uh, a bunch of models of how we were going to fix it. We we bought some cut proof uh, socks, which uh, was the first thing available we could find that was sort of cut proofing. That was from ice hockey, and um, and then there was another guy that got injured in Japan that summer, who uh, it was Norwegian. And he was, we don't know if he was wearing the cut proof socks. He was wearing cut, he was wearing socks that look a lot like the cut proof socks, but they make a cut proof version and a not cut proof version. And they got left in Japan with all the blood. Mm. And either way, it doesn't matter. They weren't up to the job. Like it wasn't a high standard of cut proofing. Uh, we then went through a process where we tried to redesign the elevator and the class actually voted no to that. Uh, so we had a design put in front of them December, January this year um, that they could, we could have voted to change like within a six, eight weeks type of thing. And, and they thought it was too late in the quad to change um, what's a pretty critical element of the boat for, for racing reasons. And they voted no. And um, so then we went through and have commissioned the, the, the build of these um, cut proof pants, which we have put into the notice of race of the world championships coming up. So every NACRA team has to buy two pairs of cut proof pants, whether they were going to wear them or not. And they've got two layers of Cat5 cut proofing optimized for the backs of backs and sides of the legs, which is where uh, most of these foil strikes have been hitting. You can imagine the crew's or skipper has been looking mostly forward when they've been falling in. I mean, there's cut proofing rough almost as everywhere we can put it, but they have to be able to move a little bit better. So there's some of the regular elastic material. Are, are these single and manufacturer those, pants or is it is it something you buy from different sources or what, what, where do they get, where do you get them? We went with a speed skating company that custom that makes cut proof pants for speed skating. So we figured that well, they have a lot of experience with cut proofing, and they also have an athletic base. So they've 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 recommended to us the materials. They're getting them made in their factory. They're going to ship them down to Worlds for us. And uh, and there's a they're going to have a little bit left over for the public if uh, there's some A cat sailors or what have you want them. They can go to our NACRA 17 shop and and pick those up. They'll be delivered mid November, and I hope they um, will you know, decrease our, our major risk case, which is a bad cut going, uh, not being able to be, you know, fixed up very easily. I mean, someone, people, people have lost a lot of blood. Of course, it's kind of the impact of it is accelerated in water probably as we've all know from movies like Jaws, but it's pretty serious <laughs> stuff. And, and, um, and, um, you know, it's not really joking matter. We we are at the same time. NACRA is designing L rudders, yeah. which um, instead of having T the rudders. elevator, and they're going to be designed to be blunter. And those we will implement immediately following Tokyo. You will. Well, I as a hockey player, and I know you're a hockey player as well. In fact, your equipment we saw in the tech checks back over there in the right corner behind you, over your well, your your left shoulder. And apparently, you're a fairly new hockey player, right? You just picked up playing adult league. Men's league. What yeah, I mean, I wanted to play hockey my whole life, but I had a Scottish father who didn't want to wake up at 5 a.m. So uh, soccer it was, and um, the, I just moved. I just moved uphill of an ice rink here, so it's about a five-minute drive to oh, a good. good ice rink, and they've got a league, so I started playing. Good, good for you. Well, I back on the the hockey cut-proof socks. I had not heard of those, and I understand that they're available. I, I've heard about them, but I haven't seen them. I wasn't familiar with them until just in the last couple of weeks. And I, I had never heard of them with respect to speed skating, but that makes sense because obviously that's, that could be a scary sport. But I have seen guys in hockey have their Achilles tendon cut. Yeah, know, so that it, it this, springs, the up, cut yeah, springs up into your leg, Julia. Julia's, yeah. Julia's giving, look, do that face again. Right, huh? <laughs> Awful. She went, ah, <laughs> ah, ah, ah. 
the cut proof hockey socks were designed as a uh, antidote to that to that Achilles tendon cut issue, which uh, can happen. So. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, as I said, I've seen that happen to a couple different people. One live and in color. It was not. It was really not not very pretty. Let's talk about mixed gender. And on the foiling cat, we know it is a mixed gender. It's required that there be a man and a woman. This is really the first such class in the Olympics, and now we've got some others. Uh, how does how is that working? And what about this latest round of emails going around about the Muslim country saying that they don't like this and they're going to complain about it? Not just in the knacker, but in the other classes. Um, well, I, I, athletically, I think it's awesome. Uh, you know, we've got. You know, well, sailing is a long history of men and women sailing together, so that's not shocking. I mean, uh, any of us who have done college sailing, that was often one of the setups. Um, and uh, the NACRA 17 just takes it to the next level. I mean, uh, I, I think it's great. I think uh, it's having nice. a mixed gender boat makes perfect sense for our sport. And um, and uh, and I think the NACRA is doing a great job of it. Certainly both sailors uh, at at either of the four positions they can occupy by gender and by position are, are enjoying it. And uh, um, how many women, uh, how many women are steering at the very top of the class? Um, at the Europeans, there were four out of, out of the top 11 were female helms. And so, I mean, it's not 50%. It's, it's a little bit less than 50%. I think over time when, now that this high performance pathway for women is more entrenched, we might see that number go up slightly. I mean, at the time the FX came about the NAC, the 49er, sorry, the time the NACRA came about, the 49er FX started at the same time. So you had two destinations for any any uh, female helm that, that might have wanted to try and go that route. And of course, there was no pathway for it. So, um, you know, you had a few people doing open 29 or a few women doing open 29er. Uh, uh, Lynn, uh, Lynn Senholt is a uh, good was a good 29er helm uh, but it, you know i think when the 29er was open at youth worlds you get something like five mixed teams out of uh, 30 entries and now that there's a an all-female 29er at the youth worlds you're getting you know fleets of 30. Mm. So, I, so i do think it'll take a while for for that to flow through you know at the time when these helms and and women were growing up their options were the 470 the yingling and the radial probably mm. probably missing something 470 women uh, you know the they were aiming different different mm. places, and and uh, we'll see how it goes. But there's certainly um, a good chance for a, a female helm to win a medal or maybe the gold. Yeah. Okay. Well, I I like it actually, and we've all sailed all our lives, growing up with with family and women and men and you know all combinations. And I the Muslim countries that object to it, particularly in this this offshore mixed gender offshore. What are we calling out the Keelboat, I can't remember. I had an acronym for it, but I haven't used it in a while. But Julia, you you said that was the thing that was causing some angst. You've seen some of those emails yeah, about it's, the Muslim it's countries the, not wanting. No, we can't have a man and a woman out in a boat that overnight are not, overnight that are not yeah. married and are not. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, we got bigger problems than just that in the sport and otherwise. Okay, uh, there's a video here that you sent me a link to. Do you want to play? Shall we play this video? The yeah, Seiko sure. 49. We'll video, do you want to do a setup or you just want to talk good uh, voice over it? Uh, I won't. Uh, I, I'll just play it for like, I don't know, a minute or something. Okay, and here. we can talk. I, I want to bring out the, I want people to pay attention to the, the beautiful flags and the big numbers and the tight race courses. And you'll see how it all plays out. Okay, here we go. jostling for who will be the highest boat on port yeah it's five against three I, I left your mic up so carry on when you want to yeah so this is the 2012 <laughs> european, the champ Less european than a championship Less than a minute. it was start. the first time we did in on the start theater style racing which was our uh, big is between the mission. orange flag on the starting oh, vessel years. and on the and orange flag off. on the go ahead i'm going to turn the audio down all the way so we can hear you I couldn't quite hear you there, Tom. So yeah, go like, ahead. I, 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 I'm turned their audio on this video all the way down so we can hear you talk over it. So this is theater style racing. This is 2012. SAP was the sponsor. And where was this? In Lake Garda. In Garda. Um, so you can see, there's, if you just look in the mid ground there, you can see a series of string of yellow buoys, a white buoys there, and that's the boundary. So they're going to get to the boundary pretty soon. They've already hit the far boundary. 
Oh, yeah, I see it. Yep. So, so what you, it does is it brings everyone really tightly together. This is eight boats in an eight-minute target time race. So those white little look, look, look like milk bottles or Clorox bottles. So it's a pretty narrow. Forget about the Hobie Cat outside or the, the windsurfers that are in the bottom of the shot. It's those white buoys, and they've got to stay between those two. And the and this was what the twenty twelve Europeans was this an experimental? I'm race? having a little trouble hearing you talk. So. Was this the, an experimental race? What was this? He's not hearing you. Can you hear me? No, I, I can't quite hear you. But uh... okay, well, there's something. Our audio is n- normal, so check check your audio at that end. Okay, but anyway, so this was this was a, the idea. You've got some kind of an announcement, right? So the reason I sent you that is I just wanted. Uh, oh, we still got the audio. Button. Oh, we can hear you. Okay. Um, the uh, I wanted to highlight sort of some of the things we did when I first came into the class, which was uh, well, actually before when I was on the executive of the class. We introduced those uh, big flag sales so that people could tell from a distance what country the person was. Uh, probably those people watching the Beaker Camp Club uh, invitational right now were appreciated the big country flags on the spinnakers, the same sort of thing. So we did that in 2010. And then based on um, the fact that we were in Garda and our, and our tests, we couldn't see what the sale numbers were whenever it was on video. That's why how we came in with these black backed uh, numbers with the white numbers, which we now put on all the uh, 49ers, and we're about to put into the uh, NACRA 17. This has all been building on a broadcast strategy that we've been trying to implement since 2012 uh, uh, as technology advanced and uh, trying to make fleet racing exciting for uh, for sailors to watch. You know, for a long time, we've had match racing that's been really exciting to watch on TV. We've had uh, ocean racing that's been, you know, on TV but and, and, and other ways, but popular as well. But as a fleet racer all my life, uh, I've always loved the complexity of fleet racing and, and trying to tell that fleet racing story well. Um, it's been something we've been chasing for a while, and, and this was kind of the, the beginning of some of the, the things that you see more commonly now, um, both in our classes and others. And um, theater style was sort of the, the format iteration of, uh, of how we envisaged uh, um, bringing more excitement and more intensity to, to the race course and, and theoretically to NBC, and uh, that was the first test right there. And, uh, you know, it was a really good example of uh, how action-packed sailing can be uh, I don't think we're going to have time to get through to the end of this video, but it's it's a pretty exciting finish. And uh, but do you have some kind of an announcement coming out that the class is doing with respect to TV? Yeah, I sure do. So um, first to, first to hear it here, worldwide announcement with all the fozy. We have uh, secured a broadcast sponsorship by Sky TV New Zealand. They're going to cover all six days of our upcoming World Championship in Auckland from December second uh, to eighth. And uh, it's going to be TV production quality, like I said, all six days. And uh, it's going to be, you know, they're mad about sailing down there. They'll be able to put on a, a good show and we'll be able to bring the worlds to uh, sailing fans worldwide. Okay, so say that again. This is Sky TV. You're having a joint world championship of the 49er, 49er FX and Knacker, correct? Yeah, joint world championship in Auckland, December 2nd, 8th. Uh, obviously, we've got really competitive teams in all three classes, uh, Gemma Jones, was fourth at the last Olympics. Alex yep. Maloney and Molly Meach won the silver medal at in the FX at the last Olympics. And then, of course, we've got Burling and Tuke uh, in the 49er. And, um, you know, on the back of, of their fame and uh, and the fact that they're sailing mad and with the America's Cup coming up, Sky TV New Zealand is going to pick up and broadcast uh, the entire regatta. Do you, you know how many hours of coverage and is the racing all going to be in the harbor? Is it going to be close in? No, we've got something like uh, 12 different race courses to suit We've got we run four race courses at the same time, uh, so we've got 12 race areas that are optimized for all the different wind directions there in in Auckland, and uh, we've got RF capability, so we will go to the race courses that are best suited for sailing on the day, and they will broadcast from uh, I think it starts at 11 every day all the way through till the end of racing, so it could be you know five six seven hours per day. Uh, I think they're planning a break in the middle as we switch between the two fleets, uh, the first shift and the second shift. Uh, so each day we'll cover like 49er in the morning and FX in the afternoon or, or NACRA in the morning and 49er in the afternoon. It'll rotate through the week. Um, obviously, as we get later in the regatta, it'll be all the gold fleets. And uh, and then we'll finish off with some medal races in the afternoon on the final sun. That sounds great. 
Yeah, okay, so you're going to get a lot of live coverage, and this is in early December in Auckland on Sky TV, and I guess we'll, we'll be able to get video from that live and probably replay as well. Yeah, we still we retain the digital and international rights. So we're speaking right now to other international broadcasters. If you are a Fozzie out there who uh, has a connection to a TV station, the, the rights are available. Get in touch. Uh, and for countries that don't get it picked up on TV, which I imagine will be most uh, based on the history of sailing, um, we'll have it digitally for you, um, YouTube or possibly an app. For, or we'll get we'll make it available certainly. Good. Well, con- congratulations. That's great news. And we'll look forward. You're formally announcing that by press release, what, this afternoon or tomorrow? Uh, Monday. Monday. Cool. Okay, well, we'll look forward to that. Nice to have a little bit of breaking news on here. Uh, Let's go to the phones. And we've got questions and comments. Julie, do you have anything pressing? Uh, Yes, but I have two comments that relate to the the, uh, AC boats. Uh, Let's hold those for later. Okay. Anything specifically here for... Yes. Ben. Okay. Um, what have uh, your, your classes done to comply with World Sailing's FRAND po- policy? Well, that's, that, that's an offshoot of what we were talking. You want to talk about FRAND for a minute? Yeah. Um, comply with World Sailing. It's a bit nuanced. So World Sailing's fiduciary duty is to make sure that the events go up for review. That's why you saw the laser, which... Um, that's why, so basically they started with the oldest classes, the classes that they had not reviewed in the longest period of time. So the laser had been in there since 96 and the RSX had been in there since two, uh, since 2004. So that's why they didn't want to do all of us at once, all the 10 Olympic classes at once, because they thought that would be too hard. So they started with the laser and the RSX. Yeah, let, been in there hang on, Ben. So let me, and, uh, let me explain. I'm sorry. Friend, no you want to explain friend or shall I? F-R-A-N, fair, reasonable, and? Non-discriminatory. So basically the contract, well, at the world sailing level, all the different boats have to be um, eligible to be selected for the Olympics on a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory basis. That's how you saw um, the RS Arrow and the Melgis 14 and the um, Devotee D0 go up against the laser in a trial. And I think there were a few more applicants. So that was a fair, reasonable, or and non-discriminatory process that went through, and ultimately the laser was reselected. RSX is in the middle of that process right now, um, and and 49er and NACRA haven't gone through that process yet. We will go through that process in 2021 as the next cycle starts. Um, so from the world sailing point of view, like our turn hasn't come yet, but it will, I guess, in in less than two years. Um, from an internal point of view, the same rules apply, the same laws apply, as in we have to make sure all of our part suppliers are up for review on a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory basis, and um, and we're going through that process. I mean, we have done this stuff for a while, like the, the NACRA uh, mass contract got signed only two years ago. They, they did a review two years ago, and, and you guys didn't hear about it. It wasn't in the news, but it happened. And the 49er mass contract is, you know, they're just signing it, and, and I'm sure they'll announce pretty soon. Um, and, and, you know, so we have to go do that for all the different parts um, on a schedule. And okay, world so you're not doing part. it. You're not doing it now, but you say you have to in the future, and you're planning to do to start to comply in 2021. Yeah. So world sailing is asking us to take a look at our schedule of when we will review everything. I think this November, I don't know if it's necessarily a conference business or just regular business. Um, so we're producing a document document like the laser you, you actually read the laser one pretty recently that said you know from 24 12 months before the olympics to blah blah blah. so we have to make our own version of that that you know sets out in the public when we're going to review everything and um and we're in the process of drafting that okay how about 2024 will the class be foiling upwind and john emmett's asking this question will it be foiling upwind for 2024 and if so does that another major redesign and alex aldana down in Brazil is saying, well, doesn't that mean a whole bunch of people who are in the class now or trying to get in the class kind of spend thousands more on yet another upgrade or change to the boat? Well, the first thing we're doing, I, I've already told you, and I, the class knows as well, is we're changing to l rudders after the Olympics. So those are in testing right now. Um, and we'll go for an official class vote in November uh, based on the outcomes of the testing. But the, the 
the class already wants to do this from a safety point of view. Now we're probably putting, or we are putting in a little bit of extra lift in the elevators than compared to the current elevators. So the theory is that it should make it, you know, the, they're right on the edge of foiling right now. And uh, at least the theory is that just a little bit more surface in the elevators will take it all the way. Not in all conditions. Uh, you know, there's no active surfaces um, and it's not as uh, the the power to weight ratio isn't as high as like an all carbon boat. Like we, we have price, we have material limitations to keep the price down. So, um, so it remains to be seen what wind range it'll foil up wind, but there will be foiling up wind next squad. I'm pretty confident. And it won't require, it'll like the, they'll have to buy new rudders, but they're not that expensive. Certainly not an Olympic campaign scale. Okay. Some people are saying, you know, you shouldn't make these major changes more than say two every other quad because of the cost, but we'll see. Julia, you've got a question? Um, there's just m m more uh, more comments on that. that uh, I thing. see I see one here from Andrew McPherson. Maybe we'll cut to this one. It says, the main yeah. culprit causing tissue trauma is the bulb on the elevator. It's a sharp point and s will still do damage to the tissue and can break the skin through cut-resistant clothing. Removing the bulb or moving the L rudder uh, is really the only way to reduce this risk. I think you were talking about that a minute ago. Yeah, so he's taught, I call it the torpedo, he calls it the bulb. Uh, it, if you've looked at moth foils, uh, you have recognized it. It's it's basically in there for to keep to keep uh, the join, or the T-join, uh, yep. where the rudder and the elevator meet more efficient. But it does, if, that, if that's what hits you first, it's, it's you know, it uh, does cause a lot of damage. Um, and, you know, we're going to get rid of it uh, just as soon as we can. But like I said, the sailors voted no to an elevator change. So um, so we've got it still. Okay. Julie, anything else? Clark Chabins may. It's, yeah. you, Julie always reminds us to go back and read the comments, and, and you should as well, Ben, because there's so many people making comments. We just simply don't have the time to, to identify them, let alone read them all. But uh, Steve Groover's made some interesting comments, uh, Peter Jorgensen and so on. Uh Josh Tozo is saying, and he is the marketing manager, comms director for, not comms director, marketing director for U.S. Sailing. And by the way, Josh wrote a great piece that I ran on the website. Julie, you saw that. Yes. And you commented on it and encouraged me to post it. And if you haven't seen it, uh, Ben, go have a look at Josh's piece. It's every class manager, class officer, yacht club leadership, everybody should read this piece that Josh wrote. It, it ran in Scuttlebutt. I ran it as well on Sailing Illustrated. But he is, he, Josh, is saying, great news, can't wait to watch the 49ers and NACRAs live in December. And Jody Shields is saying, cool, do you need an Aussie commentator? I might know a guy that would be interested. <laughs> Try to get Jody to come across and help Sky TV. Yeah, and Jody. Then, and then Steve Gruber saying, are you serious, an Aussie commentator <laughs> on Sky New Zealand? <laughs> Sky ends it. Uh, no, were, actually, we're just starting that discussion. So uh, we, I was I thought they'd want only New Zealand accents, but uh, apparently they might be open to foreign accents, foreign to them accents. So uh, we'll see on. how it's, it's, it's not a, yet. Decided. It's a big world today. You know, we all we listen to Andy Green on the, the you know, his, with his British accent on the New York Yacht Club commentary. And we all get used to uh, Andrew McPherson is, uh, says they will need a Kiwi commentator so the locals can understand the accent. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, and good. So a lot of people are jazzed about that. Uh, and choice, choice as sweet as bro, as Kiwi spell purely phonetically. Bernie Wilson. Welcome to Bernie Wilson. Okay. Well, that's cool stuff. Anything else? Um, Ben or Julia? Jody Shields suggested earlier that banging the corner style racing in Olympics would be fantastic. Yeah, and that, of course, is his regatta that yeah. he runs. Yeah. Th th that he there on Lake, I guess, Lake Macquarie. I pitched it. I pitched it. I wanted uh, the ninth and tenth medals at the at the review to be a men's moth and a women's moth, and um, and anyone who was already in the Olympic regatta could enter. It'd be a fleet of provided boats. You have twenty one boats there and three fleets of six you got three spares and uh just send them on these five minute bang in the corner style courses downwind if it's light and and up and down if it's windy uh but everyone loves their boats more than their sailors i thought it'd be awesome to have someone win two gold medals at a at an olympics or the chance to 
Yeah. I couldn't agree uh, more. I think that's one of the problems we have in the sport that, that it's an advantage that swimming and track and field and some of the other sports have. I wish you would also, in your formatting discussions at World Sailing, consider ways to get the best sailors, irrespective of country. You need a class like the laser that's one per country probably, and maybe some of the others, maybe the windsurfer, I don't know. But there should be some classes where multiple sailors from or multiple sailors from a single country can go because if you've got the best fin sailors or used to in the UK and you got to the top two or three guys, it seems grossly unfair that they can't send those two or three guys to go run in the hundred yard dash like you can in track and field or swim in the swim in the, the whatever the race is and swimming. I'm actually going to pitch something like that for the next go round for 2024. You know, we're a lot, we're not quite at that level of uh, decision making yet, but I do think I agree with you. I think if you know, you got to, we've had it a bunch of times in a bunch of different classes where the guy who's sort of fourth in the world doesn't even get to go to the Olympics. Um, but uh, on the flip side, I think we'd have to make sure that the big nations who are put in two in one event ha give up one of their other spots so they don't actually get more of the 350 places than they already do. So I, I'd like to pitch that option to the to the, the big countries. I don't know if that'll be a winner or not, but well, I think, and it's not necessarily big countries. It might be a small country. I, mean, I don't. You think of New Zealand as a small country, but it's a big sailing country. But right now, they've got two of the best laser sailors, and you know who knows. To, well, two of the best 49er teams right now too. Uh, they had uh, 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 Dunning Beck and and. Uh, Smith, or I get their names mixed up all the time. Anyways, they just won Keel and uh, beat their their uh, Burlington Tuke. So you know, the, there's a lot of countries that it could apply to at various times. Okay, well, anything else, Julia? There's just a, a point brought up. I again, not uh, on for the AC boats, but we we're wondering why they were um, asking for boat builders. And Rob Fry says, I think you'll find a lot of the crew help build the boat. So now they have to go sailing. They need uh, boat uh, builders. Good point. Uh, that's a good point Rob Fry makes. And of course, Rob is Leonard uh, Takahashi's dad, and he must be over in France because Leonard, of course, is on the uh, Japan, Sail GP Japan team. And they are getting geared up for the, as Jody calls it, Jody Shields calls it the Marseille million dollar yeah, that's I call it the mil miracle Marseille million, <laughs> yeah. whatever it's going to be next weekend, not this coming weekend, not tomorrow and Sunday. But OK, well, thanks very much, Ben. Unless there's anything else, there's going to be some more questions. I think you've got to really seriously address this, the, the Fran thing within the class. As you know, you've, you you're going to you got some real pressure and I hope you can figure out other ways to keep the cost down and open up the supply of parts and boats because they are expensive boats when they're smods. I mean, there's just no, no way around it. Clark Chapin has a comment on which you can read later, but it's on. He's got a couple of long ones. Too. Yeah. Clark, by the way, I don't, you've, you've heard of Clark, I'm sure, but Clark is a, uh, is an engineer. He's past president of a class, maybe president more than once. He's a past commodore of, of actually my home club in Michigan, a very bright guy. Not a bad, no, he wouldn't, he's an auto, he's an engineer. He's not a, wouldn't be a bad guy to, for you two to talk offline. And he's uh, got a lot of experience with engineering and part supplies and so on, both single and, because the car industry goes through the same thing. Do we build it ourselves or do we buy it from one of these suppliers or multiple suppliers and so on? Anything else, sir? Oh, from my end, I'm I'm surprised you didn't uh, string me up at all. It sounded like people wanted my tail on the show about six or eight months ago, but uh, it's all been pretty civilized. So, so thanks up there to the Fozy. Well, thank you. And I, you know, we don't have anybody on here to string them up. We like to get to know people. We like to ask you hard questions and you know some softball questions, but. You know, I think you handled some of the questions better than most people would have expected. But there, there is a, there's the underlying concern about cost from multiple angles. And, yeah, can I talk, maybe I'll talk about that a little bit? You brought it up a couple times. I mean, cost is important. Um, my philosophy on on the health of an Olympic class is almost. I think it's it's almost exclusively pinned on the value of resale boats. Like none of these sailors really has any money. I mean, may, maybe some of these recent pros are getting some money for the first time, but basically everyone Olympic in Olympic sailing is broke, and um, and getting that first boat is really hard. So if the boats stay consistent, if uh, the boats endure um, the the rigors of Olympic sailing well and therefore retain their value, 
not only does um, the entry entrant into the class get to buy a secondhand boat that's you know of good quality and can serve them well, but then the person who's selling it, who who maybe bought it new or, or secondhand, also gets a fair return for their money, and it doesn't cost them that much. But I think that's why the 49er has been growing so much in the last bunch of years, is because the basically the old boats are are really good to sail, and therefore they retain their value. Um, and that's where the NACRA 17, you know, our, our junior numbers were smaller because we've had these technical changes um, that, you know, we've needed to do to, to make the boat, to get the boat to a point where it's durable enough. So of the, like, if you, if you list the litany of competitive pressures that products face, you know, cost is, is just one of them. Uh, and my sailors, I think they do care about cost, but they more, they care more about things like durability, repeatability, um, consistency, uh, service of the, uh, and availability. Like there's a whole bunch of competitive pressures that, you know, at times monopoly suppliers can get accused of being lackadaisical on and they're all important. Um, well, so and, and, you know, and you've hit by the, all means feel us on cost, but everything else is, is important too. You hit and, the nail on the head. It's the secondhand supply of these boats. It's why the fin is so popular because you can, you know, some people have won more than one, gone through a quadrennium and raced the same boat in the second quad and, and meddled again. And the secondhand supply gets new people into the class. And when the ch class is getting changed every four years, Alex Saldana has made that, you know, our friend down in Brazil, and he's made that point more than once here today in the comments, makes it very difficult for existing class members, let alone people trying to get in. And it's a point that Paul Henderson and I and others have made is that the Olympics should not be the, the place where you experiment with new classes and designs. I, I respectfully suggest, submit, that the NACRA should have never been chosen as an Olympic class until it had proven itself as a robust, tough, hard-nosed, good class. We say that all the time. To your point about the moth, why aren't we using the moth in the Olympics? If, if that's where all the sailors are going, and a lot of top sailors are doing it, why don't we just put the moth in the Olympics? Well, people say all that. Putting it in the Olympics will ruin the class. I don't buy that. The, the class well, that's comes, where I think it's going to be interesting. Goes, this um, this series production thing could be interesting. You know, the the windsurfers have. Like, if you look at the cycle of windsurfers, I think we're on our fifth windsurfer now in the Olympics. And basically, every time we put a windsurfer into the Olympics, it's been obsolete pretty quickly. Or, or some people argue the RSX was never current because it was a hybrid. But whatever. Like, I'll be really interested to, to see if the concept of series production can keep the level technical playing field that I think Olympic sailors like, uh, along with the progression and competitive pressures that, uh, you know, the business community has shown to be, you know, uh, really interesting. And also the design side of things like, um, you know, the, the, if we had put in the foil or the, the formula kite for 2012, if you remember that and it was voted in, it looked so different than what the current foiling formula kites were or, or look like. Um, but if there had been series production, maybe we would have evolved this way anyways. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that goes, and that could be a really interesting model for the sport. Well, fair enough. But the other argument that a lot of people make is that the sport, not just at the Olympics, the America's Cup and other, has gone way too far on the technical side, and we should be back on the talent side. And the great thing about the classes like the Star and the Finn, the boats were robust, they were bulletproof, and it emphasized the talent. It emphasized the tactics that end the, the, the boat handling skills, the, the steering skills, and so on. Now, these boats are so technical, so highly technical, it reduces the number of people in the gene pool, so to speak, the number of people in the sailing pool. You know, you don't see people showing up at at the 49er North. I don't even know if there is a 49er North Americans or Nationals because they're just so First few. Thing. Well, but how many boats show up? You know, hardly anybody shows up. Well, there was 20 boats in Cork last week, so it's not zero. But we would love to do better. Yeah, okay. Well, in any event, that, that whole idea of this of the sport being so hyper-technical and the, have, having gone so far toward technical sailing, maybe some of the top sailors like it. Certainly the ones who are the, the top in a class are going to like it because, well, that, that's why we're here and we're there. Look who's sailing the classics this week here. Yeah, well... KR, you mean? Yeah, and, and he, yeah, uh, but he's sailing it as a he's sailing it as a as a favor to Dewey Hines. Sure, and, but and, every, it's it's all Corinthian. Well, 
It is Corinthian. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Ben. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your coming on for an hour and a half. Thank you. Live from, uh, from Vancouver, a new hockey player. A new hockey player. Aha. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Ben. I, I had the game on my stick last week, Tom. I, uh, the four minutes left in the game. Puck squirts out into the middle. I'm wide open. I see the goalie's down. I roof it. Right over the net. <laughs> we've, we've all done there and been there and done that and worse. At least I have. So, Okay, Ben Remacher, thank you, sir. Thanks very much. Thank you. Ciao. Okay, that's, uh, of course, Ben Remacher, who is the class manager for the 49er, the 49er FX, and the NACR 17, three of the 10 Olympic disciplines classes currently. And also as a world sailing official, he chairs a subcommittee and he's on an important committee uh, that has to do with Olympics and Olympic sailing. And it was interesting to hear his views on these topics. And some of the, frankly, a lot of you do not, I know, don't agree and some, some of which I don't agree. But I'm here to get the personalities and the, the opinions on the air, on the floor here, so to speak. And then we'll, we'll start to parse them in the days and weeks and months ahead. Okay, let's move on to a Bravo Zulu. And as we've mentioned to the laser class, the laser is now been confirmed by a mail vote, an email vote of the World Sailing Council. They, they rushed. I don't know why they didn't just do this in Bermuda at their annual meeting, but they did it by, I don't like mail votes, M-A-I-L, email votes. You know, you want to be able to discuss, you want to be able to have a, people around the table you want to see how they vote. I, I just don't like this lack of transparency that goes on in world sailing. And then it gives them the excuse to, oh, let's have another email vote on some topic that they think has got to happen like now. Well, it doesn't happen. Now it can happen. Everybody knew the laser was going to be in. They don't have to make these decisions until after, according to the IOC, until after the 2020 Olympics. And they could have easily made this decision in Bermuda at the annual meeting you know, put your hands up around the table type of a vote. But regardless, Bravo Zulu to the laser class, it's it, to the surprise of absolutely nobody. And this beautiful photo, uh, I've, it's in the credits, but uh, I just love this. This is from courtesy of the laser class itself. The 2024 Olympics now has the laser back in. The World Sailing Council approved it 30 to nothing. A vote of 30 zip. The laser masters are going on in the Netherlands, as you know, as we reported on Tuesday. And Pedro Foiling Sailor, Peter Stevenson, is there sailing. The 306 entries, 27 nations. It wraps tomorrow. Terrific event by all accounts. Terrific class. Well deserving of the continuance in the Olympics. Our Fozy John Emmett is there. He is leading the radial apprentices, as we told you on Tuesday. He still is. And he's leading by a big, big margin now. Um, 13 points. He's throwing out a third. Uh-huh. One, one, two, one, two, two, one, one, one. Congrats, John Emmett. If you're still watching, you were on earlier. It's pretty late over there now. You probably want to have some dinner and go to bed. I believe they have one more day of racing. They Some of these divisions, there's different age groups within both the laser and the laser radial. Some of them may be done today and others I know are still racing tomorrow. But congrats, John Emmett. It looks like you are going to be, if you're not already, the winner of the Laser Masters in the Apprentice Division. Yeah, he has to learn to be old. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's easy for you and me, but, you know, he's young. Okay. Also, the Finn Masters are going on, the European Masters. Anyway, there's a nice video. This class does a terrific job all around with management and with their PR, Robert Deves and others. And have a look at this video. I think you will quite enjoy it.
I'm gas bagging away here without turning my mic on. Why didn't you tell me you couldn't hear me in the headphones? You're, yeah, okay. So you can hear me through the headphones. Yeah. Sorry. I was just saying, I really like what the, these classes do and the, the and World Sailing, for that matter, that are doing these videos with the subtitles, with the lower thirds in them, telling you what's going on, who's leading, who's been doing well. This came out today. This is from Today's Racing in Germany. They're in Schweren. Germany, and for those of you who are geographically challenged, and of course we lived in Hamburg for a long time. It was just east of Hamburg, an hour, hour couple of yeah. hour and a half. So it's it's over here. Yeah. You can see that the red. Been there. <laughs> You've been there. Well, your late husband lived just south of there. Yeah. So that's they're on this big lake, and I've been over there. I've never sailed there, but we lived in Hamburg for quite some time there to the west, and a nice turnout they have at that regatta the Finn European masters in Schweren, Germany. And the leader is Felipe Silva from Portugal. And that event is another cool event of a cool class, 65 entries, 15 nations. And why we are apparently kicking this class out of the Olympics for 2024 is crazy. I say it again, and I won't be the last time I say it. It's just nuts. There is no class for a big person, somebody over 85 kilos, to sail in the 2024 Olympics. And I think this decision will get reversed somehow. Either we'll get another medal, something will happen, or if they are gone, they won't be gone for very long because it's a great physical boat. It brings talent as well as a little technology to the field of play. And I, well, enough said. Okay, well, that about wraps it up this week. The New York Yacht Club, the Rolex Invitational Cup is going on at New York Yacht Club. As you've seen, they have one more day of racing. San Diego Yacht Club came back, I believe, this afternoon. I think they won the last race, which has got them at the top, but just. It was very close today. A lot of mixed up racing in the very shifty conditions up north of the bridge, of the Newport Bridge in Narragansett Bay. That will be wrapping tomorrow. There's live video. And I suspect we'll be able to see more of American magic sailing around in the bay because I understand they're having their christening ceremony tomorrow. Oh, good. One hears. I'm not 100% sure of that, and I, I haven't seen if I've had confirmation. I texted a few people before we went to air. In any event, um, we'll check on that and confirm that one way or another on the website. And also this Rolex, wonderful sponsor across the globe, whether it's the Rolex Middle Sea Race in Malta or the Fastnet Race in Sydney Hobart, and, of course, both the Invitational Cup and the Big Boat Series here on the West Coast at St. Francis Yacht Club, just a couple, three blocks from where we are. That is now underway. Started yesterday, runs through Sunday. This nice photo by our longtime friend Daniel Forster. <laughs> Remember that green? Yes. Does that remind you of anything? Yes, America won. America won green. And is that somebody asked, uh, Bill Cook asked if that was left over from, <laughs> from our 2000 America's Cup campaign. It's not. But the Big Boat Series here, the Rolex RBBS, as they call it here locally, the Rolex Big Boat Series continues through Sunday. It's been light. I'm not even sure if they raced today. Did you hear any more? Yes, they, they went on the water at 2.30. So they, they are theoretically racing. They're now. racing, right? It's 2.40 right now. So 14.40. So you hear that from John Gomes or mm -hmm. good. Okay. So we'll be watching that. They did get one race in yesterday afternoon, presumably one or two this afternoon. And then the breeze is supposed to fill in tomorrow and Sunday. One of the new developments, which is very popular is this classics division. Here's a couple of them coming into the finish line, which is in front of the club, which is also popular. I wish they'd start all the racing in front of the club, but that's another issue. There's a couple of modern boats as well. But this is proving very popular, and it's also turning it a little bit more back into the way it was when it was started in, what, 65, as the big boat series. And now there's some big boats again, not just a, a lot of one-design racing. Okay, any other comments, questions here from folks before we call it a day? Clark, been there, done that. Yeah, meaning going to Mark II. Uh, John Emmett said the race that he was third and he sailed to Mark II first. <laughs> well, we've all done that. You think the reaching mark is the windward mark or the offset mark, whatever it was that he was sailing to. Yeah. Roger B. Clark Chapin, been there, done that. Yeah, Hamish Nicole. Thank you, Hamish. Uh, I think I can say 
Hamish, can I tell who sent me that video of, of American Magic? Which, as far as I know, is the first public video of an AC-75 foiling. New York Yacht Club's American Magic, which I'm, by the way, just calling Magic for short. Magic, you know that? You know what? Magic was the name of the challenger. The first, sorry, the first defender. Defender, yeah. The cup was won in 1851 by the Yacht America. And it was defended successfully. The first defense was in 1870. And the New York Yacht Club both that won the trials and then, well, it was actually a fleet race. And won that fleet race for New York Yacht Club was the Yacht Magic. Magic. Hence the name American Magic, which is the name of the syndicate, I'm told, not the name of their yachts. So they will be christening B1 as something and B2 perhaps as something else. Hamish Nichols says, no worries. No worries, mate. Okay, Hamish, I can then say that thank you officially for sending me that video, which we ran early in the show. I am gonna. I should go back and run it again, shouldn't I? Just for fun right now, Why in not? case people missed it. Forecast tomorrow for the Laser Master Worlds 2019 is no wind after 1300. John Emmett is saying, so quite a few drunk masters t- <laughs> tonight. Commodore Pfaff is watching out in Watch Hill. Commodore, we're missing you. We hope you come back here at some point sooner than later. Let me see if I can get my slides up here. I, don't, I, want, I, don't, I want to go back to that video. I think I do. Okay, I'm rolling the clock. I'll tell you, I'll put it up on the website. How about if I do that? I'll put it up on the website, and then uh, you'll be able to look at that That'll video again. Okay, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, Hope you have a great weekend. We'll see you on Tuesday. In the meantime, sail fast, sail safe, sail smart, and have fun. Ciao. And share. And share, Julia says, and share. All right. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, everybody. Ciao. Bye.